in an absolute depression, in a state of total anxiety as I'm absorbing more and more of this brutal information. I'm watching documentary after documentary. I'm getting just swarmed with way too much information, none of which my, my heart, my mind, and my soul can handle. I, I, I really start questioning whether or not I want to live. And in that moment, I, I, I just had to do something. I, I, and I walked out into the middle of a GMO corn and soya field, and I decided I was going to plant a tree. And I declared in that moment that I was going to build the farm, the community, and the school that I wish I could have grew up in, both physically and digitally. All right. Are we rolling? Rolling. Awesome. Whew. Where do I begin? Hi, my name is Marcangelo Coppola, and I am a philanthropist, storyteller, and a farmer. And, well, those might seem like three really distinct and interesting titles uh, that don't really have a lot of overlap, but let me tell you the story of how I got here and how they actually really do come together. You know, being an entrepreneur for me has always been in my blood. I, I literally can remember it to some of the earliest days that I had as a child when my parents would do a garage sale and I would go out and set up a lemonade stand. And of course I was supported by uh, the, the, the talent and then the support of my family. But the truth was for me, it was always exciting. It always felt really interesting to participate. And whether I was collecting magic cards and trading those at the card store or finding ways to invest in myself in the future, there was always something that was sticking out. But there's this one story that really for me internally cemented that I was going to be an entrepreneur inside of me. And I didn't know the term, even that word was not in my lexicon at the time, but I knew that I wanted to work for myself. I knew I wanted to kind of put in the hours and the effort to really being that entrepreneur in so many ways. And I remember this so clearly. I remember my grandmother giving me a gift and I think it was the equivalent of, of like 50 bucks or something like that, $40 or whatever it was. And she gave me the gift and she said, you know, go spend it on whatever you want. And of course, me being the gamer that I was and, and super addicted to video games uh, on Nintendo or whatever it was, I wanted to go buy the latest Nintendo game. And so I go with my father, you know, we're coming home from, from my grandmother's place and we stop by Radio Shack, which at the time was where people went to buy video games. And as I'm looking at the games and I'm trying to pick out which one I want to buy, my dad looks over at me and he says, Mark, don't you want to buy this coin counting machine? <laughs> I'm like a nine-year-old and I'm like, why would I want to buy a coin counting machine. And he taught me something in that moment that I think was incredibly impactful for me. He says, well, I've got a ton of change at home and every day I come home, I'm using cash and cash was very, you know, very popular back in the days, uh, in the nineties. And I, and I come home and I have change and I take this change and I put it in a jar and I put it in a drawer and I, and I just forget about it. And loonies and toonies are, are very valuable here in Canada, where, which is where I'm born and raised here in Montreal. And so there's always, it was like an accumulation of, of a real amount of money that people can use. And so he said, if you count the change, if you count all the toonies and loonies and all the quarters and dimes and nickels and pennies that I have, I'll give you 10% of whatever you count. And I thought about it. And I was like, well, wait a second, but how much do you have? And of course I'm learning math. So all of this becomes this kind of life lesson that my dad is teaching me. And I have this choice in that moment, one, buy the video game and go and experience the short-term pleasure that is playing video games for whatever amount of time that my, my small nine-year-old mind can kind of maintain focus on any given game or invest in this automatic count, coin counting machine that I can just throw the change in and get the little rolls and then swap them out and slowly but surely count the change that my father had. And that machine was basically gonna take up all the money and I wouldn't have enough money for the game. And I, I thought about it. And I said, you know what? Yeah, fine. Let me buy the coin counting machine. So we go home and I keep the receipt. My dad basically starts teaching me the principles of accounting and the principles of like tracking my expenses and learning how to uh, build a little business 
uh, doing this. And, and of course, I'm excited about it. I'm also nervous. I don't know how much change he has. And I remember counting the change and he had like $250 worth. So I counted all of that. I rolled it all up. I gave it to him and I got $25, but not before I would have to take all that change and go to the bank. And so I remember going to the bank with my dad and I pretty much, I'm pretty sure that's when I opened up my first ever bank account under my own name as well, or at least maybe it was a joint bank account with my father. But I remember just going to the bank and trading that in for bills. And this is again, before coin counting machines were found in every grocery store. Like this is the era of, of something like this. And my father, he inspired me to start something called cash for change. And so we ended up making a little flyer you know, those little flyers where you cut out the bottom and people can rip off the tags and we've set them up. We set up all these little flyers in grocery stores, the local grocery stores near my hometown. And my dad started connecting me with some of my neighbors and going with me to knock on my neighbor's doors and ask if they had any change that they would want me to count. And of course I would charge this 10% fee for. And that business, I didn't really realize it at the time, but it ended up actually making me a ton of money. I remember this one neighbor that I went up to, they had $400 and I ended up making $40 for what, a few hours of work. And it was going so well that as a nine-year-old, I ended up hiring my little brother who's two years younger than me. And I invested in a little uh, counting machine for him too. And so him and I would go and knock on the door and we would do these things. And it, and it felt so exciting because it was the first time I had ever understood the concept of investing in something more than just the immediate moment, more than just my, my happiness right here and right now, but in a longer term vision or a longer term future. Again, these words come to me today, but they, were, they weren't as profound, let's say in that moment, but it, it triggered years and years and years of this kind of stuff happening. I mean, I remember my father discovering eBay and, and, and the, you know, how PayPal was coming up and Amazon had just started up as a store. And there was this really interesting opportunity where there was an arbitrage um, for like a drop sh shipping business. So today you, you go online and you find people who you know, buy off from China, put it on Amazon and sell uh, and make a profit and make margins. And they never even see or touch the product. They're literally direct shipping it to, for you and you're running Facebook ads and all that stuff. It's super popular online. Google drop shipping business or FOB or whatever it's called um, business or whatever it is. And you'll find a ton of information about this. But I remember my dad discovering that box set DVDs are, were selling for, let's say, $35 on eBay of Lord of the Rings. But you can go on Amazon and buy them for $32, right? $32 and ship them directly from Amazon to whoever would buy them on eBay. And so you'd put them, you'd list it, you'd do either a buy it now, which was like 40 bucks, or you'd, you'd do an auction but you would also charge shipping and Amazon had free shipping and they also had gift wrap shipping, meaning they would get the box from Amazon, but they didn't even know it was coming from Amazon. And so I would list box set DVD after box set DVD after box set DVD on eBay. And the second somebody checked out and bought it, I would take the money, transfer it into uh, you know the account and pay, buy it off Amazon with my dad's credit card because I was too young to have my own, of course. Um, and then ship it directly to the person who had bought it, you know, somewhere in the States, let's say. And I did this over and over and over again. And I remember getting into Pokemon. Maybe that was when I was like 11 or 12 years old. And then all of a sudden I want, walked into a, um, a uh, flea market. And at that flea market, they had these Pokemon pins and they were selling them for a dollar. And I was like, I imagine that these Pokemon pins will sell super well on eBay. So I asked him, I said, what happens if you buy them all? What, what price would you give me? And I think he ended up, you know, we ended up negotiating down to like 75 cents or 60 cents per pin. But then I would go online, list them for $5 and people were buying them time and time and time again. And then I would also charge shipping, but shipping a pin back in the day wasn't all that bad. So I, I had found something deep inside of me. I mean, that started to infiltrate every aspect of my life and every aspect of my my mentality. But for me, there was always something missing in that. There was always something exciting about making money, but it wasn't the thing that motivated me. I, I feel I've always been motivated by community. And I grew up with, you know, Italian family, uh, Italian descent. 
I spoke Italian for the first five years of my life or first four or five years of my life. And I only learned it when I went into going to kindergarten. But the truth was that community and family has always stuck with me. And I remember the first time I ever told a story. I was actually spending, uh, I believe, like a month with my grandparents. My, my, you know, uh, my cousins were from Ottawa and they were coming into Montreal. And we were, we were all going to spend time, my brother and I and my two uh, cousins, Lara and Vanessa, we were all going to spend time at my grandparents' place. And my father gave us a challenge to film a documentary, uh, a story of two tomatoes and two pizzas. And the premise of the story was we were going to track the journey of the tomato that was grown in my grandparents' garden and the tomato that was grown in big farm production and actually follow what those two journeys of those tomatoes would, would do, how they ended up in the same fridge and then how they would end up in two very different pizzas that were all handmade in you know, a wood burning oven at my grandparents' place. And I remember having an absolute blast. It was such an amazing time. It was such a powerful moment for me to be on camera. And I was so horrible at it. I, I, there's, I mean, there's outtakes of me saying the same thing over and over and over again. Well, remember my Mr. Angelo Coppola? Here we are, Mr. Angelo and Mrs. Margarita's um, bar. Mr. Angelo and Mrs. Here we are and Mr. Mr. and Mrs. The couple is yard. And of course, I'm translating between Italian, because my grandparents are speaking in Italian, and English, and doing all of these different things. But I also deeply remember how important making that video was. And I recognize now, today, looking back over the years, as I've been able to watch that every once in a while, as I pull it out of the archives, just how powerful that was. And that was my first taste of farming and connection to the soil. I remember being so impressed by how a single seed can turn into a plant, can turn into an entire fruit, and how each and every seed contained the entire ecosystem of a tree. And it just fascinated me. It fascinated me to know how powerful nature could be, how impactful this could actually be for my own uh, life, and how nature was so much bigger than I was, but that you had to understand patience. And you also had to understand patience when you were storytelling. And so those were the, the tastes of what it was like to be an entrepreneur, what it was like to be a storyteller, and what it was like to be a gardener or a farmer. And as time went on, as I graduated high school and something called CGEP that we have here in Quebec and Canada, um, and then went on to university, I followed the traditional path. I followed the path that my mom would always say, you know, go and get a really good job. And in her mind, that was like becoming a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant, something like that, right? Doing the thing that was gonna make me financially successful and essentially follow the path that my parents had followed for success. Um, even though my mom was an entrepreneur when I was very young and she was running a clothing store uh, for children and she would dress me up in all of these fancy clothes that I never appreciated. Uh, and Maybe still to this day, that's why I wear blank t-shirts uh, and, and really try and have no brand associated to me when it comes to clothing. But all this to say is I was incredibly, I was incredibly trusting of what my parents were telling me at that moment. But when I got to university, I really started to see the breakdown of how university was, was kind of a sham. And that happened for two reasons. Number one, I started studying in finance and accounting, and honestly, I, I hated it. I ended up switching over into uh, a double major, and I graduated from McGill University with a marketing and entrepreneurship degree. But at the exact same time, the exact same time when I was going into university at 18 years old, I ended up buying into my first ever kind of real business, a business that I had sustained for what ended up being three years. And literally I was working full time, four or five days a week, 10 hour shifts, 10, 12 hour shifts, sometimes longer. Uh, and I was going to school full time, but I stacked my school schedule that I would go to school Mondays and Wednesdays or Tuesdays and Thursdays 
all day from nine in the morning till nine at night. And in that moment, I was, I was living this dual life. I was living the life that I had always lived as a student, um, you know, since I was a young kid going to kindergarten and, and, and even pre-K uh, all the way until that moment. And I had that identity wrapped up inside of me and it always served me. I was always a good student. It was pretty studious and, and I always did my homework. I got A's. I was, I was kind of an honor roll kind of student. And that's not to brag. It was just to say that I, I cared. And I think I grew up with a, a loving, caring family and somebody who, um, and, and my parents who constantly inspired me to, to try. Um, and then I had this other identity where I was running this business and I, and I was part of running an indoor skate park, right? So for skateboarders or rollerbladers or BMXers, we literally had an indoor 19,000 square foot skate park with a 7,000 square foot mezzanine that looked onto it. And I had this vision of building the community I wish I could have participated. Now the drinking age here in Montreal is 18 years old. And I remember at that time, I wasn't really, I wasn't really into drinking all that much, um, but I was definitely the type of person who would smoke a joint every once in a while. And I felt like I couldn't tell my parents. I felt like I couldn't be myself. And I felt like there was so much of our social structure that was based around drinking and getting shit faced without really considering what it would be like to actually have just a cool spot, a cool space where people can interact more like a lounge uh, without blaring music or some artificial line out, uh, outside, without having to stand in the freezing cold that is Montreal winter so that you don't have to pay coat check. Uh, and it also had really good food on the South Shore of Montreal, which is where I grew up and where the skate park was. And so I was going to merge those ideas together and build this lounge. And long story short, the, the lounge, it collapsed. I ended up having to um, go to the bank and get a loan. I got pre-approved, but the financial crisis hit, so that loan got revoked and there was nobody giving out loans anymore. I went to apply for every grant, every young entrepreneurial grant or bursary. Uh, I, I tried to do everything possible to get that money to build that lounge. And finally, when I was able to actually amass the money and do all these different things, I ended up having to sell the business because my partners in the skate park, which had a $20,000 a month overhead in rent, hydro and insurance, hydro meaning electricity and insurance, every single month from 18 to 21, somehow we were paying this off, even though we were paying off the rent, even though we were paying off the loans that we took to actually buy the skate park. What ended up happening is my, my partners ended up having a very different vision. And so I own 50% of that skate park and they own 50% and we kind of came to a stalemate. And the timing of that happened to coincide with me graduating university. And so here I am, the student who more and more and more as I'm in school, recognizing school is not teaching me what I need to know. And it's giving me the book smarts, but not really the street smarts that I'm learning in my business as an entrepreneur. I'm recognizing this dichotomy that's pulling me apart and it's making me feel more and more dissociated from the standard paths, from the path that my parents had said I should follow and that had clearly worked for them in, in their own life. And, you know, going from essentially poverty to, you know, the middle class and being really, uh, you know, good and stable and, and happy. But that happiness, it wasn't there for me. It, it was not something that I was able to find in that moment. And so in my last semester, as I'm going through the process of literally selling my business and cashing out for the first time ever, which in the end ended up being a blessing, but in the moment was felt horrible. I, I had this kind of identity crisis because all my identities that I had been with my, my first ever baby as an entrepreneur is this, is this indoor skate park, as well as my student were just disintegrating in front of me. And I had this kind of big unknown cliff that was coming up. So on the back of my last exam, literally like on the back of the actual exam itself, I ended up writing out a manifesto. And I remember studying for that exam, listening to the same song over and over and over again from uh, um, this movie that's called Requiem for a Dream. I think it's called Lux Aeterna or something like that, right? It's this song that is incredibly epic. And it was playing over and over and over again because I was using it as a study technique to listen to the same song over and over and over again to, to remember all the information from my exam. I write out this manifesto and I ended up asking a teacher if I could take a picture of it. 
and and I transcribed that manifesto, and it's it's now lives, you know, lives on. But in that moment, I dedicated myself to building a movement, to building something that was going to empower me and actually teach people the real knowledge, not just the stuff they would learn in textbooks, um, but something that was really truly going to empower people with the actual experience that you needed. Because as much as I was pained by selling my business, I had learned a ton. And the number one thing I had learned is that I needed mentorship. My partners in that business really were the people who made that business run. They, they, they were the under, you know, they were the, the, the pillars of running that skate park. And I brought a ton of value and I really helped out, but I learned so much from going to the school of life, of real life, where you have bills to pay and things to do and, and things don't all fit into the box like they do in a Scantron at school. And so I go on this journey. And so the day that I literally received the check from my business, pretty much like the next day, I'm on a flight going to Australia and I'm on my first ever backpacker trip. And I learn on the flight down about NLP, which is known as Neuro Linguistic Programming. And I start learning about the details of storytelling. And I start testing out what my new story might be as an entrepreneur. What would this look like if I were to change my story? What's next for me? And I meet people and I start sharing my story. And then all of a sudden I, I transition from there after five weeks to China. And I land in China knowing nobody, going nowhere. I, all I have is a lonely planet. I don't even have a cell phone. And I land in China. And then I learned the other half of storytelling and marketing, the stuff that I didn't learn in school, which is that a story, well, it has a pattern. And it has not only a pattern, but many stories when we, when we you know, surf the web or when we're driving by a billboard on the side of a bus or uh, on the side of a, of a highway. There are stories told in fonts, in colors, in symbols, in shapes, right? There are stories that we feel because we receive them through sound and through so much more than just what is said with our mouths. So stories and storytelling and marketing became this upgraded thing. But the other thing I started when on that trip is that as I graduated university, I decided I was gonna watch a documentary a week every single week for 52 weeks straight because I didn't want schooling and what I was doing in school and the fact that I was now out of school to get in the way of my education as Mark Twain would say, right? And as I learned storytelling, I'm traveling, something struck me. I watched documentary after documentary, documentaries like Zeitgeist where I learned where money comes from, documentaries about conspiracy theories as whether or not the government had you know, set off some false flag operation. I learned about peak oil and the vanishing of the bees, uh, climate change and the melting polar ice caps. I learned about environmental degradation. I learned about so many challenges. But there was one thing that really stood out to me week after week and month after month as I would watch these documentaries each and every single time. It's that each and every one of those documentaries was spending about 90 to 95% of the time talking about the problem, but only about 5% of the time talking about a solution. And I realized that the narrative of the, of the media that we consume on TV or now on the internet, the narrative that we were seeing in these documentaries was always kind of alarmist. And we actually had a narrative problem because we needed to scale the good news, scale the solution and the story of the solution more than anything else. And that's when I recognized that I needed to use what I learned in marketing as a storyteller to do social good. And so marketer upgraded itself to storyteller and entrepreneur upgraded itself to philanthropist. But the question is, for what cause? What can I do with all of this knowledge, with all the knowledge that I had gained from the book smarts and the street smarts and then traveling and the perspective that they gave me on the world and all these documentaries I was seeing each and every single time. There's two stats that really stood out to me that really inspired me to move in the direction of becoming a farmer. And the first is that for every one article that talks about the solution to climate change, there are 
80 articles, eight zero, that talk about the problem. So the narrative war really was something that we had to document the solution. And we had to show that over and over and over again through the power of YouTube, through the power of social media, which at the time was only budding up. And, and the year of the protester and all of these things are were moving into, into existence. And the other one was that at one point I was looking for a documentary to watch. I was looking for something to inspire me. And I open up Google and I'm, I'm sitting in front of it and I, I don't know what to type in. And so I remember typing in, if everyone lived like, and the auto, you know, the autofill suggestion starts filling out, if everyone lived like the average American. I click that and I learned that if everyone lived like the average American, we would need 4.1 planets just to survive. This is in 2011, mind you, right? So I type in, well, heck, I'm a Canadian. What, is, what does it look like if everyone lived like me? And turns out if everyone lived like the average Canadian, we would need five planets to survive. Five planets if everyone lived like me. But a few months earlier, I had been to China and I knew that China was accelerating more and more and more and that these third world or second world countries, I hate the term, but whatever, that they all wanted to be like us. In fact, there were so many of them that were holding up umbrellas so that they could have whiter skin or bleaching their skin in Asia because they wanted to live the lifestyle that we had, that I had. And I recognized at that moment, I was part of the problem. And the only thing that made sense for me was to be a part of the solution. And so, in an absolute depression, in a state of total anxiety, as I'm absorbing more and more of this brutal information, I'm watching documentary after documentary, I'm getting just swarmed with way too much information, none of which my, my heart, my mind, and my soul can handle. I, I, I really start questioning whether or not I want to live. And in that moment, I, I, I just had to do something. I, I, and I walked out into the middle of a GMO corn and soya field, and I decided I was gonna plant a tree. And I declared in that moment that I was gonna build the farm, the community and the school that I wish I could have grew up in, both physically and digitally. That I, I was going to point a finger at others and at the problem, that I had to realize that there were three fingers pointing back at me, that I had to be a part of the solution. That if I'm going to change the world, I might as well start by making my bed. I might as well start AKA within me and within my own choices and my own life. Now, I'm not saying this because I wanna preach that I'm somehow perfect, that somehow I figured it all out. But the journey of planting that tree and starting a movement that I didn't realize had really begun at that time, the journey of becoming a farmer, which is something now I'm incredibly proud of and I now do full time, the journey of becoming a farmer, the journey of transitioning into a philanthropist and being a storyteller, all of these skills came together to build that movement that I know is possible, to build the world that we know is possible in our hearts. And so that is the story of Valhalla. That's the story of this farm. And I started with the skills that I had learned. I started with the marketing knowledge and, and, and the, the ability to tell stories and my understanding and my study of those stories to build something out of nothing in the same way that a small little seed contains the entire ecosystem within it, all the necessary elements that turn into a tree. I recognize that I had that same power within, that through a strong why, through a strong commitment, I can actually change the world if only I believed. And well, I've been on this journey ever since. I didn't know anything about what it would be to be a philanthropist, and maybe you're wondering what that looks like too. To me, a philanthropist is somebody who's dedicated to the ROI of return on investment and also the other ROI of ripple of impact. Combining those two things doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. You can make money and live a good life, provide for your family and build a family, buy that beautiful home, but have it be ecological, have it have really good composting system or rain catching systems, have it be really well insulated and have it be off the grid with maybe solar panels or well water or whatever it is. And that's what Valhalla is, building a permaculture farm out of principles that think long-term. And so for me, the principles of permaculture 
really inform us in such a powerful way. Way more wisdom is found in that than there ever will be found in any human invention because there is nothing like a mycelial network. There is nothing in the world that grows like a tree. There is nothing as powerful as the universe itself and the magic that comes from those seeds that grow into something great. And so that long-term vision that was bestowed upon me through learning about the principles of permaculture, through studying the ways that water flow, and through surrounding myself, not only as the only input or the only human input to this ecosystem, but with other people who are smarter than me, other people who have other talents, artists, creatives, talented farmers and permaculturalists, learning about where our soil is built and how it's built, learning about the microbiology of compost teas and how being a farmer is more about farming soil than it is about farming vegetables and fruits. And I'm, I'm incredibly passionate about it. I've learned so much on being in a farm, learned so much through mentors and people who have walked this path before me and stand each and every day on the shoulder of giants. Because at the end of the day, I am just a kid who grew up with entrepreneurial tendencies, with a love for stories, with a love for community and family, with a love for nature, and with a love for something, something that really moves me. Valhalla is a sandbox. It's a, an experiment of sorts. And we fucked up. We've made a ton of mistakes. I mean, we, we've gotten fine from the city. We've gotten, you know, our neighbors to hate us at one point where we dumped a bunch of tires because we were going to build an earthship, which are buildings built out of tires, bottles, and cans. And, and at the exact same time, we've had problems with dynamics. I mean, we were 20 something year olds who were all coming together to live in a house and move out of our parents' basements to build a community having never done this before. And so, yeah, we've cracked a couple of eggs to make this omelet. Yeah, we've hurt some people along the way. Yeah, we've tried to accelerate way down uh, certain paths that might not have been the right ones. But in so many ways, we've also done so much good. We learned about crowdfunding and storytelling. We've started businesses that went on and are still in existence today. We've started companies and organizations. We've got people in jobs. We've literally built careers, including my own, including my own out of all of this stuff. And we learned about meme culture. We learned about social media and telling stories online, how to scale the story of an impact, how to build an online school like I ended up doing with Superhero Academy, because I learned that many eco-villages and permaculture farms made more money from education than they ever did from farming. And so in all of this process, I still come back to the roots. I still love more than anything, the bliss and the joy that I feel when I plant a tree the bliss and the joy that I feel when I put my hands in the earth and I, I literally can taste the soil, not only through my, <laughs> the dirt that's in my mouth because I'm working so hard sometimes, but also through the absorption of the wisdom of the world through my skin. I just, I don't think there's anything I've ever done that's been this important. And I've been able to connect with the most amazing and incredible people. I've built a community around myself that has vastly changed my life. And I've built friendships and partnerships with people who this project is not possible with. So Vahala is dedicated to proliferating freedom culture, to empower and encourage all individuals to spread their unique gifts to the world. In fact, that's the same mission of Superhero Academy, and it's the same mission of our education and community center and our farm. It's, it's the, the why, the raison d'être in French behind everything that we do. Because when I turns to we, even illness turns to wellness. And that is the solution. More than anything I can ever teach you about where to plant the plants or building ecological buildings, the solution is found in community. The solution is found when we recognize that we are not alone on this planet. And that if everyone lived like us, well, hopefully it would only take one planet to survive. That's the mission we are on. And I believe that this journey will empower us greatly. I believe that we'll eat healthier foods. We'll learn about 
what's going into our food in the first place, and we will learn what it takes to build the solution from the ground up. I don't know of a more noble cause and a more noble way to learn. I don't know of a better education that comes from real world experience and real life mentorship and real life mistakes than I've had at Bahala, and I couldn't be more proud of the people who surround me. So it is with great love and appreciation that we step into the next phase of Bahala. We take the farm to another level where we invest time and energy, build the first house so that we can bring in more farm support and that I can dive further and further into the farm itself, as well as the managerial task of telling the story, doing the accounting and the financing, building the business plan so we can attract investors and grow the farm into more and more and more. At the end of the day, Valhalla is just a farm, a field of dreams of sorts, physically and metaphorically, but it is so much more. It really embodies the heart and soul of a community, and it has changed my life in a way that, well, nothing else could. So with that said, I hope to see you on our land. I hope to see you participate, whether that be from far or from close, but I hope that this inspires you to build your own movement, something we can all use a little bit more of. Mm -hmm.